The two ships that we're looking at are the RMS Queen Mary and RMS Queen Elizabeth, two of the largest liners of their day and the pride of British engineering. Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth were designed during the interwar years. At over 80,000 tons each, both ships exceeded 1,000 feet in length and were the largest ocean liners of their time. Built to carry roughly 3,000 people, both passengers and crew, these ships carried upwards of 15,000 people during their World War II service, dwarfing the passenger capacity of today's largest cruise ships, but more about that later in the video. Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth were envisioned to be the largest passenger transports in the world, with the goal of offering a two-ship weekly transatlantic service. This was the age before mass air travel, when ocean liners were the only way to cross. At this time, the main mode of transportation for the majority of long-duration transcontinental travel was by ship. The North Atlantic was a highly contested body of water, and shipping lines on both sides of the Atlantic had been battling it out for supremacy since the middle of the 19th century. Queen Mary entered service in 1936, and her construction was not without its own dramas. You can check out my video about the construction of the Queen Mary by hitting the I or in the description box below. By 1938, Queen Mary was celebrated as the world's fastest ocean liner. The newer Queen Elizabeth was to join Queen Mary in passenger service in 1940, but World War II put a hold on that. Instead, the Queen Elizabeth was sent to New York in complete secrecy on her maiden voyage. And I've also done a video about Queen Elizabeth's maiden voyage which you can check out in the description box below. By March of 1940, both liners were laid up in New York, awaiting orders. And they were not alone with many other famous liners also berthed in the harbour, including the iconic French line Normandy. Ocean liners have been called into military service for about as long as ocean liners have existed. In fact, it's only relatively recently that aircraft have been the main mode of transportation for military movements around the world, with the majority of conflicts relying on transport by ship to move both troops and materials between different parts of the war zone. This was certainly the case during World War II. The Queen Mary was requisitioned by the British Admiralty in March of 1940, while Queen Elizabeth was called up in November of that same year. Both of these ships were converted into the world's largest troop carriers, which the Admiralty hoped would be a great asset to the Allies. But how did they go about converting ships that were designed for the luxurious transatlantic passage with their Art Deco, refined interiors, into troop carriers. While Queen Elizabeth hadn't yet been completed as a passenger liner, Queen Mary had been in active service for several years, with her last peacetime voyage leaving her berth in New York. So the first thing that took place on board Queen Mary while she was berthed in New York was the removal of valuable items from on board the ship. This included the majority of furniture, carpets and art, as well as anything that resembled the ship's luxurious origins. This kind of finery wouldn't be required for her role as a troop ship. The ship's hull and superstructure were painted grey, and her name was painted over, in the hopes of making the world's most recognisable ocean liner a little bit less recognisable. Queen Elizabeth had already been given a similar paint job before she left the shipyard where she had been built. Queen Mary then sailed for Sydney, arriving in the harbour on 17 April. She was sent to the Cockatoo Docks and Engineering Company, where the true conversion work was undertaken. Queen Mary's public spaces were largely repurposed, with many of the ship's onboard amenities taking on a more utilitarian nature. Space was of a premium on board, so even the first class swimming pool was converted, with bunks installed here, as well as in pretty much every other part of the ship that was available. While the ship's dining rooms retained their mealtime use, the ambience and cuisine changed dramatically. The large first class dining room became the main mess hall, due to its large size, while officers were welcomed into the smaller and more intimate tourist class dining room. The ship's highly acclaimed international shopping promenade also underwent a change, with military officers setting up shop here, although the barber shop was retained with barbers on board to see to the needs of the officers and the troops. Now despite being a luxurious ship, the majority of the Queen Mary staterooms did not have private bathroom facilities. Rather, there were shared bath rooms located down the hall. This probably made it easier for the conversion process because these spaces could be expanded, allowing for more bathroom space for the increased capacity. 
Additionally, they also increased the space of the galleys to allow for an increased food service. Queen Elizabeth underwent a similar conversion in Singapore. Structurally, both ships were altered with reinforced protective covers on the bridge windows. Sandbags were utilised to protect vulnerable areas, and there was the installation of degaussing coils to reduce the risk of contact with sea mines. Furthermore, both ships were fitted with anti-aircraft guns, although in reality their speed of over 30 knots was their primary defence against enemy attack. The conversion took two weeks for each ship, a remarkably quick time frame when you think about the scale of works that was done, although Queen Elizabeth did require some extra works to be completed when she arrived in Sydney. After the conversion, both ships could carry up to 10,000 people per voyage. Queen Mary was completed first, and departed Sydney on trooping voyages to the Middle East, carrying Australian and New Zealand troops. Queen Elizabeth joined her several months later, and the two ships sailed in convoys with other requisitioned ocean liners. When the United States entered the war, the Queens were redeployed to the North Atlantic service to aid in preparations for the D-Day landings. Their original design to undertake regular transatlantic crossings as well as their speed and their size made them perfect candidates to assist in the movement of troops on the North Atlantic Ocean. As the need to move more troops increased, both ships were altered to up their carrying capacity even further, with both Queens regularly transporting over 15,000 people. In fact, the Queen Mary still holds a record to this day for the most people carried on a ship, 16,683 people on a single crossing. As you might imagine, the experience of sailing on the Cunard Queens during their wartime service was very different to how it was advertised in the peacetime brochures. It was considerably more crowded, so to maintain order and stability, the ships were divided into three zones, with movement controlled through these zones. Keep in mind that these ships were designed to carry around about 3,000 people, that's both passengers and crew. They also weren't huge ships by today's standards. Although they were giants for their time, they were only about a third of the tonnage of the Oasis class of cruise ships, but they were carrying more than twice the number of people that the Oasis class carries. Another thing to think about is that Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth retained their Cunard White Star captains and officers for the duration of their wartime service, so the experience for the officers and crew on board was very different, and a lot more dangerous during the wartime service on the Queens. Too fast for convoys and outrunning their escorts, both queens sailed solo across the Atlantic for the majority of their voyages, maintaining high speeds throughout their crossings. This was their best defence, but it did mean that they were alone in dangerous waters. In fact, unbeknownst at the time, Queen Elizabeth passed in front of the periscope of an enemy U-boat, while Queen Mary was involved in a tragic collision with the HMS Curacao. Both of these stories are best saved for another video. So let me know in the comment section below if you're interested in hearing more about Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth's wartime service. Although Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth were by no means the only ocean liners being used for trooping services during World War II, their sheer size and the number of people that they could transport and the speed in which they could make the crossing had a big impact on the Allied war effort. The troop carrying capacity of the Cunard Queens was, and still is, unmatched. Never before have two ships carried so many people in such a relatively short period of time. Their unique characteristics of size and speed, as well as the navigational skill and professionalism that the Cunard White Star team brought to their operation, allowed the Allies to move entire divisions in a single crossing, something that had never been possible in any past conflict. In fact, at the height of their service, the Queens were transporting over 30,000 US and Canadian troops per month, and the Queens were responsible for transporting half of the Allied divisions involved in the D-Day landings. It was this impact, and the advantage that it gave to the Allies, that led Sir Winston Churchill to acknowledge the Cunard Queens as having helped shorten the war, saying in a letter to Cunard Chairman Sir Percy Bates, that without their aid, the day of final victory must unquestionably have been postponed. When their wartime Atlantic service came to an end, the two ships had moved more than 1.25 million people, but their service to the war effort was not over. In fact, after the war, the Queens completed a stint as repatriation vessels, joining other Cunard White Star liners, including Aquitania, Britannic, and the Second Mauritania, in transporting troops and war brides across the Atlantic. 
In 1947, the two queens were able to enter transatlantic service as passenger liners on that two-ship weekly transatlantic service. The ships were famous on both sides of the Atlantic as well as across the world. In fact, in many respects, they were as famous as many of the famous passengers who sailed on them during the golden age of travel. The two queens maintained a weekly transatlantic service until the middle of the 1960s and have gone down in history as being two of the finest ships to ever transit the North Atlantic Ocean. Fortunately, with the end of World War II, we have never since needed ships to carry such numbers in a wartime scenario, and the Queens will hopefully remain as the largest troop transports the world has ever known. Thanks so much for watching, I hope you found the video interesting. These two ships are two of the most spectacular ships in the world, in my opinion, and I really do enjoy sharing their story. So if you'd like to hear more about the Queens, you can either check out my website at chriscunard.com or let me know in the comments below what else you'd like to know about Cunard's famous Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth. If you're interested in their backstory, don't forget to check out my videos about the constructions and maiden voyages of both of these ships. I've linked them in the description below. If you're interested in what's going on in the cruising world at the moment, check out my cruise news playlist. Or if you're more interested in more maritime history, including looking at the Carpathia, the ship that saved the Titanic survivors, or the QE2, the successor to the original Queens, check out my maritime history playlist. Thanks again for watching, and when we are next able to set sail, I hope to see you on board.